listen to a technical talk by our eminent uh, scientist, people scientist, Dr. S. Soma, sir. He will go with the detailed, uh, hopefully about an hour uh, on the various topics, okay? And sir, we will come down for listening to this. And the stage is all yours, sir. Uh, my talk today is uh, on a technical topic, uh, which is basically my area of specialization structures. Uh, all of you are civil engineers here? Yes. Yeah, all of you. And uh, all of you have done some course in uh, structural mechanics? Maybe. Some of you may be doing further course, right? Strength of materials. And uh, you know a little bit of design of structures. And you know how to analyze and model hardware. And a little bit of understanding of finite elements. Know what is natural frequency. No? Sure? <laughs> no, I, I just because I am not really knowing the depth that you know. That's why I am asking these questions. You know how to conduct a response study for a forcing function. For example, an earthquake comes, how the structure will respond. Can you find out? Maybe. If you little more effort, then you will be able to find out. Okay, so I will, I will try my best to explore what is involved in a structural simulation? Why do we design a rocket? So why I use the word is not structural design. It is structural simulation. That means you can create computer-based analytical tools to design and understand a rocket structure. So this is what I am going to do today. Uh, quickly go through, but it's this is such a very vast subject. Uh, in, uh, in, at Trivandrum, we have at least 100 engineers working in this area. My team, 100 of them, which are specialized in structural design, mechanics, dynamics, fracture, slows, pogo, uh, elastic coupling, and so many problems which you will see today. So what I am going to do today is only to expose you to the type of analysis and the tools and type of the knowledge that we need to have to understand the rocket before it flies. Right? So various issues which are going to come up, the various models that we need to create and then understand it. It is a very long term process. So I am going to talk about the GSLV Mark III, which I was a project director, so I am, I am sure I am eligible to talk about it today. So this uh, vehicle has been uh, flying last three launches happened successfully. I was the launch, uh, project director for the first launch, where we called the experimental launch. But later, two launches happened with the satellites, and they are working very well. And we are getting ready for the next launch with the Chandrayaan 2. It is likely to happen in July. So, this DSL rocket, possibly some of you are aware, and I will be using some terminologies here. So, it is interesting something called S200, which is a solid booster here. And L110, which is the liquid stage here. And C25 is a cryogenic stage here. So three liquid sta three stages constitute this rocket. And what do you see from here to here in our measure is only structure. It's like a building. Everything is contained inside a set of structures. For us, everything is a structure. The payload fairing, the, the propellant tanks, the motor cases, the nozzle, the engine, everything is a structure. And everything should meet the requirement of a structure and everything should be understood in its completeness before it actually flies. When I say completeness means I must understand all the loads that is going to happen there and to understand loads you will have a big problem. And all the temperature conditions it is going through, thermal environment must be known and all the dynamics that is going to happen in it should also be understood and you should design for it. All the responses that the vehicle is going to feel while it flies through air or vibration and acoustics, we must find out and then analyze it. So it's a very complex problem. But before we did this GSLV Mark III design, what one thing we did is we understood from the already knowing PSLV and GSLV and what all systems are common to this. You know, that much less only work only we need to do. So this is one exercise we do all the time. And we also follow certain heritage. That is, whatever we know today, we are only improving incrementally. Like what we are discussing today, innovation. Every rocket is an improvement over the present day. We are not drastically making a new design. But of course, some of them are there. 
I will first talk about, just to familiarize with you before I describe the structural problems. The solid water you can understand that you can see a person standing here. You can compare the size. This nozzle opening is much bigger than a person's height. It is almost 3 meter in diameter. And through that the plume comes out. And the entire motor, 200 ton of solid propellant is cast. And for us, solid propellant is a structure. You can imagine when you put a propellant inside a motor case, it's, it is kept in horizontal condition to sand. It is a solid material, but it is rubber-like. And if you keep it for a long time, it will sand. You can understand the rubber of 200 ton rubber, if you keep it circular, piece, you keep it, it after some time, it will become elliptical. So how a rubber material changes its size, uh, shape, that is one of the structural problems. So it is a very complex system. And this nozzle is a moving nozzle. This nozzle is pivoted here using rubber springs. It can move. And this has to withstand the pressure of 60 atmosphere. It has to withstand the 2000 degree centigrade temperature and still work without use, still without losing its stiffness. And this stiffness determines how much force I have to apply to move. And the force is to be perfect, precisely calculated. So it is again a structural problem. This is a liquid stage. Its liquid stage contains propellant tanks made of aluminium. This is manufactured with such a thin shell, just 2 millimeter, but 4 meter in diameter. You can imagine such a big tank, but it is so thin. If you push with your hand, it will form a dent. But it is supposed to carry the load of the rocket and fly safely. And a lot of structures, engines, complex propulsion modules, and many devices that makes this liquid stage. The cryogenic engine is much more complex. It has very complex structural elements like tanks, interconnecting structures, pipelines that goes through the engine, and finally the engine itself, which is a a uh, collection of various turbo pumps, turbo machinery and pipelines which carry the oxygen, hydrogen, very high temperatures, something like 1000 degree at that order. So, the engine has to perform meeting all the structural requirements at these temperatures. That is a problem. So, these are the type of structures that are used in uh, a cryogenic stage. We have propellant tanks made of aluminium and this aluminium is a welded tank and there are interfacing structures Rust frames and separation systems. So all of them, I will be using an alloy called 2219. AA2219 is an alloy of aluminium, which is fundamentally based on alloy aluminium and copper. It's an alloy of copper. So it has a very high strength. Uh, it's typically like steel. It is as strong as steel. So we use this aluminium, and it is designed with a factor of 1.05. You can look at it. So a civil engineer will never design anything with a margin of 1.05. Will you? Suppose you design a building for a certain, uh, say, uh, 10 ton per meter square loading on the top. The factor typically in civil engineer design is 3 to 4. Nothing will happen if 4 times the load is put on top of it. But a rocket is designed, it can handle only 5% more than the design load. 10% it becomes will fail. So you can understand if you have to design a structure with such a low margin, then you need to understand it perfectly. If you, your understanding of it has become weaker, the material strength is weaker, your modeling is weaker, your ability to predict stress is erroneous, then you are likely to fail. So this is a criticality of design of rocket structures. If you make it heavier, it will stay there only, no? it will not fly. Rocket has to be made as light as possible so that it can lift as much mass as possible. So the challenge here is to make it very, very light. So our designs are all extremely light to just to meet the margin of 5% over the expected limit. So that is the challenge here. <coughs> Unfortunately, the, present, the slide is not sharp enough or the view is not sharp enough. Uh, you will look at the quake uh, you, I have many parameters, no? so ultimately you design, this is the load on the building, uh, then you design the building. So similarly in a rocket also, for us the rocket is a very tall building. When you are standing on the launch pad, it will be acted upon by various forces. And when it is flying, it is very acted upon by various forces. If it is flying through atmosphere, one of the important forces is called drag. That you can understand what is drag? And there is an aerodynamic forces. 
If it is trying to turn, immediately there is an aerodynamic force that lift comes in. There is something called acceleration because the force is acting. And the whole of this result in a static equilibrium. So you can analyze the whole thing with the thrust, drag, aero forces, acceleration and control forces all acting to make the whole system statically determinate and you can find out the forces on it and you have to calculate the deflection and slope at various points. So this is the first step of understanding the structure. Before understanding the loads, you have to do simulation in ground. So how much load drag is produced, how much lift is produced, you cannot theoretically find out very precisely, but today we know how to find out theoretically. So you make models of the rocket, we put in wind tunnels. So where the air flows at very high speed, like the rocket blows, and we do measurements on the rocket, and also do a computer simulation of the model in a computer. To solve this, typically how much, if it flies through air, and how much drag is produced, how much lift is produced, it's a very complex solution problem. You would have heard about the equation called navier stokes equation, fluid flow problems and it is to be done in millions of grid points. So it is a very complex problem. To solve this problem in a supercomputer, it takes typically one day to two days to just to run one problem. Uh, a, typically a 100 uh, teraflop machine, it will solve uh, in uh, one day. A very simple problem of this nature. Some problems takes one month to solve. So it's a very complex model that we make with a large number of you know, final measures. We subject it to supersonic flows and we just calculate what is the type of loads that are happening on the structure. And we also test it by making scale model and measure the forces and moments. And that is what is actually used in the real rocket calculation. So it is the knowledge of the aerodynamics is essential for a structural design. So this year only I told earlier what is important. So if somebody asks you what is lift, what is drag, what is moment coefficient, what is center of pressure, you should be able to understand. So this is one of the uh, challenges that you will face. If you look at the structures, they are all funny looking now. Like uh, the civil engineers look at structures in one way, the rocket people look at it in a different way. There are classical structures which you are seeing here. Some of them are ring shaped. This is a composite structure. This, this we call skin strength, stringer construction. It's a shell with a lot of long reinforcement. And there are cross type structures. There are mechanisms in the, put inside the structure. And there are pressure vessels. So uh, we design various, lot of types of structures. And each one of them are capable of handling very complex loads system. For example, this hardware, you see, this is capable of handling at least 6,000 tons of force. 6,000 tons. It will weigh not more than one ton. So we have to design a one ton hardware which is capable of handling, sorry I made a mistake, 600 tons. So its self weight is only one ton, but it is capable of handling a load of 600 times of its mass. So that's the type of design that we are doing. Uh, look at the propellant tanks then. Propellant tanks are also very very complex hardware because these are all designed with aluminium. Uh, we have uh, domes made of aluminium. This is having typically 1.6 to 1.5 millimeter thickness. All chemically milled and welded using TIG welding process. And uh, this is the diameter is 4 meter. 4 meter is typically this diameter. This is the diameter of the tank. And we store propellant inside. And it is already insulated with the insulation to keep the temperature of the high liquid hydrogen cool. And we take it to pressure testing. So this is a cage where we apply pressure and see whether it sustains. So we have a lot of propellant tanks along the rocket. And these are fabricated at uh, our HAL Bangalore Park Center. And this is a very critical hardware and nobody, very, very less people are there in this country to manufacture it. And these are composite hardwares. So you can see the size of the person versus the hardware. The heat shield at the top is as big as this. 10 meter height and 5 meter diameter, all made out of carbon composites. This is the biggest hardware that we have made for GSLE Mark III. And its mass is just 1.5 ton. So it's so huge, but it weighs so less. And very less aluminium, which you can see here, these are the aluminium parts, and the rest are all composites. And this is a composite adapter which supports the satellite, and this is a composite hardware which is our equipment, electronics brain of the rocket. So, 
we design all these composites very lightweight and it is not only a structure, it will cut like this along the length. And after reaching the required altitude, this will separate, it will cut here and it will cut along the length into two halves and separate out. So when you command it by electronic means, it will fire an explosive inside and it will cut it without causing any damage to satellite. So that also is inside. So it is a very complex hardware. We also do plenty of testing. So once you design the structure, it has to be tested. So what we do is we put the structure here, we create a framework of loading system and you can apply those loads. The, the 600 tons of force which I said it has to handle, we create a link system and we apply use hydraulic jacks which are seen we're not very clear here. We apply the load. You can apply the axial loads, you can apply the moments, you can apply the shears and then create the hardware to subject to those loads. And we put strain gauges all around. Typically in a test they will have at least thousand strain gauges and we will be acquiring them through a data acquisition system and finding the characteristic of each of this hardware, how they behave while it is loaded. Because I said the margins are so thin. So all the critical areas must be first analyzed and found out and we have to put a strain gauge exactly there. You have to do displacement transducers, acoustic emission sensors and this is a very huge instrumentation. And we will also be pressurizing using liquid hydrogen sometimes, liquid nitrogen sometimes. So we have a pressurization, we have hydraulic loading, we have instrumentation. So it's a very complex test. Uh, organizing and conducting one test itself will take at least few months. So one of the complex tests when I was PD, we did is this. We can understand this, this test rig is uh, as tall as a building which is uh, 20 meters height. So we can see inside one, two, three, four, five hardware systems are assembled on top of it. And we have uh, applied uh, loads, moments, and we applied, uh, we designed special load cells which can measure 600 tons of force. And we used hydraulic jacks which are double acting and automatically controlled. Because if you program the whole loading, it will work and generate those loads. So, such complex test tricks are designed by us. Everything is designed by us and manufactured using local industries. Very huge steel structure. This whole system itself will weigh something like 150 tons of steel uh, to design the whole test tree. Even assembling itself is a major task. So similarly we conduct on the payload firing the heat shield also we conduct. Uh, this is a cone where you can apply aerodynamic pressure. So between this cone and this heat shield there will be a compartment where you pressurize them and create their aerodynamic loads. So this only to show that we can apply complex loads the way it will actually fly and then test it so that we can understand it very well. So this is another test rig. So this is a model, a computer model of it. So we have we have flown a wind rocket. So when you want to do a wind rocket, there is something called whiffle tree arrangement. So where you can bifurcate the load into multiple points and then create distributed load arrangement on this. So it's a I can tell you this whole process of testing itself is a major structural engineer's you know, nightmare. How to create the loading conditions very precisely like the flight and then extract all the data and then understand how it performs. The challenge for a structural designer in a rocket is like this. Its margins are very thin. That means the proof load factor is only 1.1. That is at the best you can have 10% margin and at one and there shall be no catastrophic failure at 25% of the load, more than the design load. So this is a requirement. So actually if you test it up to 1.1 times and beyond, it will become useless hardware because by the time already some deformation would have set in which becomes unusable. But it should catastrophically fail at 1.25. So when you talk about margins, they are so thin. And for cryogenic tank, we have put it only at 5% because it is an upper stage hardware, it requires very low, low mass. And we design based on ultimate pressure, we use the fracture and such. Some of you may be studying fracture. I don't know how many of you are studying fracture mechanics. Anybody heard about fracture mechanics? How cracks are there in materials and how it grows under load and how materials can fail under those conditions of fracture. When the flow is there in the material and how flow gets undetected and how it can grow. So this is a very, very important domain of structural mechanics, fracture and its propagation. So, and again we look at material at different strengths. How when you reduce the temperature to something like 20 Kelvin, so much 200 degree below 0 degree, 
how would the material will behave, whether it will become brittle, whether it will become increase the strength, and uh, similarly when you go to high temperature, how it behaves. One of the model I will show you, this is a finite element model of a rocket motor. This is a nozzle, this is a motor case, and what you can see here is the flexible part of the nozzle. So it will move, I told you the nozzle can move. So what you see here is a rubber made flexure, which is alternate layers of steel and rubber bonded together. So the mechanics of this is very complex because the rubber should not be bond and the stresses in the steel and, and the rubber should be able to withstand the dual force. For example, the load from here is in some hundreds of tons. So it should remain and still it should be able to flex. So this problem is a complex finite element problem where you have to understand the material model very precisely. So we, this is a more, more closer view. So you can see how it, how these layers are formed, and you have to understand this first time behavior, which is generally nonlinear. So we do the very nonlinear material models. Similarly, geometric nonlinearity, plastic behavior of the material are all to be captured in the model. So this is very uh, tricky finite element technique. Similarly, when you test very complex survey, which I showed you one test configuration is 20 meter tall, we make an exact replica of the finite element model of the what is tested and we conduct an integrated analysis of this model. This will be some millions of degrees of freedom FEM model and we calculate at every area what is the distribution of the loads with the time. For example, the rocket is not having a fixed load. When it flies through the atmosphere, it will be experiencing a variety of loads and it will be varying with the time. So we have to understand what is the time function of the load and then look at the response. And similarly, uh, across the hardware there will be non-uniform loads. For example, in this rocket, these two S200s are pushing here. So it is giving a push of 4,000 kilometers, something like 400 tons is being pushed at two discrete points. You can imagine the similarity to understand when you apply somewhere a coil load of 400 tons, what will happen? And how hard rocket or uh, even a structure can design and handle a coin load of 400 tons. It's a huge load. And the rocket has to handle it without deforming. So when you apply 400 ton load, this will become like this. It will shrink. And this shrinkage is typically 20 millimeter in this rocket. Only 20 millimeter. And we were and it modifies the entire distribution of the loads on this with like this. So if you don't understand this finer aspect of how it varies due to the load, how it deforms and deformation induced stresses are you know, changing, you, you can't actually design it very well. So that's why it is important. We also make very complex FEM models and we look at the pattern of the stresses at every fastener. For example, if you look at this, this is a skin stricter design. So basically the green area is a skin and this is a doubler and this pink color is the longeron we call and the longerons are connected to the skin using rivets. So we have to find out that each of the rivet, there will be at least 5,000 rivets in every structure and we must understand each of the 5,000 rivets what is the load. And we have to capture them, plot them and understand the sizing and the design is perfect. So you cannot do manually, all these have to be done automatically. The, so the computer should be able to extract the loads and then tell you that you are at the right answer, otherwise you have to change it. <coughs> So we prepare on preparing very complex models. Typically the analysis of this hardware took two years. To perfect it, to understand it very well, it took almost two years to it will look after fabrication it looks so simple. You know, like an aircraft when you're flying, it looks so simple. But an aircraft design is process is very complex and it takes a lot of time of iteration and uh, design. So here again uh, we look at the distribution of the loads at various conditions. So it makes very complex models of this nature. Though this looks like this, but if you go finer and finer, you will see finer and finer details. So we make computer models of that complex shapes. Again, propellant tanks, when you look at propellant tank, it looked so simple to you. But but at these areas, they are not very simple. They are alternate layers of thicknesses. So we don't design it with a uniform thickness. They are milled or chemically milled process to create various patterns. So wherever loads are received, that area we have a progressive reinforcement leading up to the uniform thickness. If you don't do this, your weight will be so high. So we design these patterns and analyze it very perfectly to see the right material quantities only put there where the load is supposed to be taken. So this again is a very challenging work for a structural designer. And 
This is one of the work which I was doing earlier. Uh, as directly designed all of the things I was coordinating. This is a rubber based isolator. It's connecting the rocket. And when a dynamic oscillation is there, it is supposed to isolate the dynamic oscillation only trans so the static part only to it. So we designed a rubber based isolator which has a low frequency and it will suspend the whole load there and can dampen the whole oscillation into this. So this was one of the work which we did. And you can see, before doing it, we made proper models. We subjected them through testing in the UTM machine. We test created a dynamic test strip and then applied loads in oscillatory mode and make it understand how it is actually performing. So we do cyclic tests to understand its hysteresis behavior, etc. Maybe not understood by you very clearly at this point, doesn't matter. You just listen to this. Okay. I will just show one example of a hardware which failed. It is very interesting to understand. So it is a simple bus like this. This is made of titanium. And it is a mechanism which actually will separate when the first stage is separated from the second stage. Inside there is a pyrotechnic. It will cut here and it will come out. So when we actually, and this is a mechanism inside. This is a collet. We know collet goes inside, grips. And when you release the pyro, it will open and come out. And which will separate at this point. So this is a final element which actually try to capture a small increase in stress at a point when it is loaded. So analysis showed that there is a plastic yielding at this point and when you actually tested it, it failed exactly there. So the ability of the finite element model to capture this small strain behavior of this local behavior and then reproduce and test is one of the biggest challenge in structural engineer phases. So the finite element must be very high fidelity finite element tools are used. This shows the composite equipment structure. This again is a skin stringer design of a composite, but unlike Rolex, we are bonding it. So all of those who know composites, you understand composite is a multi-layer composite. So it is built layer by layer, and each of these layer thickness will contain 10 layers of 0.1 millimeter uh, fiber uh, cloth. A cloth of this type which is stacked using adhesives and this carbon fiber. And once you make it like this, it is enormously strong. And uh, to design it and analyze it, it is very really complex phenomenon again. Because you can't simply model like aluminium, which is uniform and homogeneous. It is a heterogeneous material now, its direction properties are there. So every element here must be modeled with the appropriate layer orientation. Those who understand composite can understand they are oriented in 0 degree, 90 degree, 30 degree, 45 degree, you can orient them. And this orientation will change the strength of the material. And so that's how it is designed and we make very complex models and then test them. But unfortunately when we made this hardware first time, it failed. It failed at the zone. This is the joint which I am seeing. This is one of the strain you can see here. And when you tested it, I was hearing a sound from here. But we are not able to identify where exactly the sound is coming. But after reaching 100% load, it failed at this zone internally. Still, after the failure, we are not able to find out where it failed. But then, later analysis indicated that it is failing inside one of the layers. So, when you have 10 layers, one of the internal layer fails, and you have to measure it by an external layer strain gauge and understand how it mechanics work. So, after understanding that, we have to change the load transfer behavior from this stringent to the ring because we made a fundamental error in configuring this bracket because it was taking the load from here and transferring to the ring where exactly the loads are all coming from here and we were thinking that this load will go here and then go which was not happening then we have to modify the design of this aluminium bracket like this just to avoid that failure so you can understand though it looks though global very finer aspects do matter to make it succeed so this shows uh, one of the complex models that we designed to understand the payload fairing and key sheet. Uh, maybe I will skip this because it is uh, complex for you to follow, but then doesn't matter. It only shows we don't analyze one hardware alone. When you design a hardware like this, we connect it to adjacent hardware of the equipment bay, which is already analyzed. This is already analyzed. Then we connect uh, another one which is not analyzed. And their integral behavior is found out. So this is one of the challenge. Ah, look at the reusable launch vehicle. This is something we flew in 2016. It is like an aircraft where you have a framed structure 
and a lot of framework, all machined uh, internal rigs, composite parts, launcher rounds, stringers, moving control surfaces, lot of propellant that electronics inside. If you have to analyze this, you have to make the full model. And make a full model, no computer can analyze. You cannot run in a laptop, you cannot be run in a workstation. You need a supercomputer for it to analyze it and understand. So we build, we are building supercomputers in BSSC. The next supercomputer we are building is a two petaflop computational facility. <coughs> two petaflop. What we have is only teraflop today. We are now we are building just a two petaflop machine to run such problems. We not only design complex shapes like major hardware, but when you come to finer detail, one pipeline comes from this propellant tank, goes up to the engine. This is simply a pipeline. But even to make a pipeline succeed safely, we need to go through very detailed analysis. Why I am telling is because this is a tank which contains hydrogen. You make the stage in room temperature and the moment you fill hydrogen, what will happen? It will shrink. 200 degree less than its own temperature will start shrinking and the, this tank will pull this pipe up. So it has a thermostructural problem. So once the moment the liquid temperature or the tank temperature drops, it will behave as a big load. Tons of loads will come on this pipe and the pipe will not stand. So we do a thermostructural analysis to understand each of the internal mountings, its piping, every final thing has to be analyzed to see under the service conditions it survives. So we have various capabilities to do this complex analysis. All softwares, for example, we have softwares to understand how an engine works. We have software to understand how the rotational members of a turbine called the rotodynamics work. We have a thermal analysis, we have compressed instability analysis, we have computational fluid dynamics and then life estimate. We have stratification analysis of fluids, we do engine mathematical model, mixture ratio control models. So, so many softwares will work to make the design succeed. So, one of the areas which I am describing is only a limited structural design. But there are experts in all of this area, which uh, unfortunately when I am sitting and reviewing, I need to understand. That's my problem. <laughs> okay. Now look at the engine. And I have been talking about the outside structures, tanks, propellant tanks, composites, etc. But you go inside the rocket, now you start seeing the engine. The engine of a rocket is also very complex hardware. As a structural engineer looking at this as a structure, a propulsion engineer looking at this as a engine. So here again we do very detailed finite element models. And we con we conduct internal models also, the actual engine will look like this, this is the model. And we do thermostructural analysis. Thermostructural means we will apply the various temperatures on this. This is one, yellow is one temperature, blue is another temperature, this is pink is another temperature. And once you apply this temperature and analyze, you will see it distorts the whole thing tilts through 0.3 degree by itself because of the contraction. So the engine though you assume to be is zero zero, it will never be zero zero in the real life. Unless you do this analysis, you can't understand how it will deform and uh, take shapes. So we make uh, similar models. This is the whole feed line and this is the engine, which is the simplified model and we carry out this analysis and see how this is using ANSYS we build this analysis and see that the whole deformation pattern and stresses in each of these elements are within limits. Okay, one example I can give you, this, this is an engine in which you use copper as a chamber. Inside the copper there are small small channels made for the liquid hydrogen to pass through. And this will look like this. And if you have a pressure inside, it will start bending like this. You can see here. So there is a temperature here and pressure here, so it will start bending. It is called dog house effect. So if you go on doing this many times, this surface will become uneven and the engine will fail one day. So this is called plastic deformation of material and we have to fail up using a dog house effect and plasticity. So it is again very high level of non-linear analysis of materials. Let me quickly go through another interesting area called dynamics. And what I described till now is all static problems of structures. And what I am going to discuss now is only structural dynamic area. For example, wind response. This is something civil engineers do on wind response of towers, wind response of buildings. 
then we look at the transient response. We look at acoustic response. Propulsion interaction called Bobo. Bobo is a name which you know, the Bobo jumping goes. So when fluid is oscillating, structure will oscillate and they couple. And aero control structure interaction. If you move some control surfaces, it will couple with the structures. Control forces, engine actuator loads, winds, jettisoning forces. So we create a lot of such problems. This is not a design problem. After the whole rocket is designed, we go through this whole cycle of analysis to understand how the hardware is responding to various structural excited loads. So basically, we have a lot of sources in the rocket. One of them is acoustic noise. You know, rocket is very noisy. But how much noisy is it? It is, it is so noisy. If you stand 100 meters near to it, you are dead. That's the sound. The 170 dB, you can understand 170 dB is how much you can tolerate a human being? At the best 120 dB. Short time. Otherwise 105 dB at the best. Generally this sound, the sound here is just maybe 90 dB, 95 dB of that order. So 170 dB is so huge. 3 dB, every 3 dB increase is twice the previous number. So we can understand 170 dB is so huge. And we have unsteady aerodynamics. Thrust transients in liquids, wind, stage separation, control forces, engine dynamics, actual dynamics, propellant dynamics, all these movements in the rocket creates the responses. And we have to calculate every response before the launch. And after the launch also, if you see a response, you should correlate with what it happened, why it happened. This acceleration has to be given by structural design. So unfortunately the picture is not clear. Uh, what I want to tell you is when the rocket is flying through this, you can see the air around it is very turbulent, lot of energy. It creates lot of sound. And this sound is the reason for the acoustic loads. The, the speed is so high. You, you can imagine the speed something like 2 kilometers per second is the speed. When it is passing through the air, it is 2 kilometers per second. It is faster than a bullet. And you imagine a 600 ton rocket of 5 meter diameter passing through the air at bullet speed. So it generates such a huge sound and the sound will affect the hardware and it can create responses. So what we do is we make the actual hardware, we put inside a chamber. This is a blue, yellow color is a chamber which is 1 meter thick concrete and we close the door. We put a big horn, sound horn and we create the sound inside of the rocket noise. So it is called acoustic test facility. So you can actually create a vibration chamber and test it and see how the hardware rocket part will respond to such sound. This facility is at Bangalore National Aeronautics Laboratory and this is joint work of ISRO and NAL to create this facility. And we can actually, this silver color items are the sound absorbers that we put inside. So when the satellite is here, the sound is outside, so when it goes through this, the hardware plus the absorbers will reduce the sound, so the satellite will feel a lesser sound. At least 20 dB production we can achieve through this acoustic protection. So this is another structural engineer's work, how to design acoustic protection systems. So these are the models we make to do the dynamic studies. The earlier models were static models. Now we are coming into finite element work for dynamics. They are entirely different work. Those who understand finite elements will understand. The, the, the rigor which is required to make the static analysis model and the rigor which is required to make a dynamic analysis model are entirely different. And, and when you make these models, you can actually calculate natural frequency, response, damping, and so many other parameters. For example, how it moves, flexes, how it will move through the air, etc. And see, you can see the beam now, how it distorts. So we plot the mode shapes. These are mode shapes. The actual rocket will look like this, but we simplify it to a form that you can visualize how it moves. And once you know, know this movement only, we can actually design a control system. If you the control system has a frequency which is combined similar to this frequency, your control will fail. So you have to keep those control system away from the natural modes of the vehicle and this itself is changing over the time because propellant is moving out, mass is changing so this will also be changing so you have to design the control system with the full knowledge of how the model evolution takes place with time this is one of the important critical so another work which you do is transients 
that is in the rocket engine if you look at there will be oscillations in the chamber pressure there will be oscillations so if i look at the pressure they will look like this and i can find out the characteristics inside so we do fft fast fourier transform that can identify the content of the vibration check with the finite level model how it responds and whether it is detrimental to the rating this is another dynamical problem this is a typical problem called wind response of buildings now you know anybody know how to design long chimneys civil engineers so when you make long chimneys with tall chimneys there is a big danger in chimneys can you tell me what it is anybody who is aware it is called water shedding water shedding is a phenomena when the wind blows on a long chimney there is an obstruction to the wind so immediately at the back side of the chimney the air will start swirling and the back side and the side so two swirls will form left side or right side air is flowing like this left side will be swirl right side will be swirl and what will happen in water shedding is this will alternately excite first it will swirl then it will detach then this side will come and swirl and detach so it will equal to pushing and put this side up left and right so if the detachment and reattachment of air couples with the natural frequency of this that power will collapse so it is called water shedding induced dynamic instability so you have to understand same thing that happened to rock, rockets so whoever is going to design chimneys please remember there is a very critical knowledge on how to understand water shedding and how to aerodynamically design tall buildings and towers etc civil engineers must know maybe you are not learning in this college and maybe it may not be taught in detail but if you are to actually design a tower of that you need to understand how wind affects tall buildings so we we handle rocket like that so we put in exactly equivalent models we make we excite it using shakers and we also apply the air at the speed and then see how it responds so we coincide with it and then see how loads augment so this is called air elastic testing so and once you know this you can incorporate all structural input into our computer models so our structural people are not structural people alone they are computer experts so they make models which will which can be integrated with computers and then it can actually excite the rocket and then see so this is called flux flash so we make a computer software which is called flexible trajectory so actually vehicle flexibility is inside the computer now so when i fly it it will be moving like this and flying through the computer and we can actually capture all its dynamics from the computer so that is the beauty of such a software and we all also put it in testing this is an aslv test rig this photograph is 1986 that's why it looks so old and this is pslv when it was tested this is 1990s so so we actually assemble the entire rocket and then shake it and see it will not couple like this this is pslv and this is dslv mark 3 so we have kept the whole rocket like this here there is a bearing <coughs> which will keep it floating after assembling the whole thing with my hand i can move it so we put it on a zero friction bearing so it's another interesting thing i will show you the picture and this is a zero friction bearing so it's an air bearing and you have put a flat hydraulic thrust bearing so it's a complex arrangement of bearings and you apply compressed air it will simply float and it is on oil film so if you push with your thumb the whole rocket will move so in that condition we it is equivalent to freely in air and then you can excite and see how it will respond to the dynamics so we have to do such a test to understand how flexibility affects rocket it is very important information before we design and send the rocket up we also shake things you no know, whatever is flying in, if you sit inside a rocket what do you feel terribly shaken so anything that you put inside the rocket you have to put first shake it and see it works so we do something called vibration testing so we have electrodynamic shakers this is a 5 meter by 5 meter table which is on bearings oil bearings and you can actually shake it this will move it like this tremendous force the force is something like 25 tons of force and we can shake it and then see this is shaking it axially 
So we have a spectrum and we can test it and see if it works. And our structural experts are there in this, how to understand the response, how to shake it, etc. So various items, every item that flies in the rocket is at least once shaken and then see if it works. So these are different pictures of items that we test. Okay, let's see. Another interesting item is that we use a lot of non-metallic pipes. This is a polyamide pipe. Polyamide is a plastic. And it is an adhesive wound around the a mandrel and we create pipes like this. And it's extremely light, 100 grams. And it can carry very high pressure. And it can carry liquid hydrogen without it. Nothing will happen to it. So we use such pipes for carrying carrying liquids within the rocket. But if you push with my thumb, it will simply deform. So flexible, so lightweight. So how to test it and prove it will work? So even the model and capture its trust was a very challenging work. We had many failures. So how to model polymeric materials which are aggressively bonded and how to capture the stress behavior? This is another non-linear mechanics problem. See, this is a test which understands slow sheen of liquids. You know petrol tankers flying fly, fly on the road? Now, have you seen petrol tankers are not single tank, they are multiple tanks? Have you observed that they will write tank in the chamber of A, B, C, D or 1, 2, 3, 4 they will write and each one 4,000 liters, some 3,000 liters they will return there. So they will never make a single tank. They will always partition the tanks and then put some holes under it. They are all interconnected but there will be some partition inside. That is, if you are driving through the road with a petrol field without partition, it will break all the liquid will flow to the front. And when you stop, it will back and the whole vehicle will be taken, pulled back by the liquid. So the vehicle cannot be driven if those partitions are not there. It will be shaking miserably. So it is called slow sheet. If you take a liquid in a tank and then fly in, in the rocket also, it will simply slow left and right. And you cannot drain it out. So we have to understand how liquid behaves in in, a, in tanks. So we create a transparent tanks filled with liquid and we excite it using shakers and see how the meniscus of liquid is changing, what type of attenuation devices are there. If this is not handled properly, the rocket can fail. It will, ex it will excite or hit the walls of the tank and the tank can burst. So we create anti-slow baffles. So we can in tanks we design certain baffles which will touch the surface of the liquid so it cannot move beyond a point. So this is again a structural mechanics problem and we can actually model in computer and understand how it works. So this shows one example how we model liquids in tanks and uh, liquid structure interaction is one of the complex uh, problem that is very difficult to model and catch. And this is another model where we are actually looking at how liquids are drained through pipes. Classically, there were rockets where which failed because the liquids were kept in propellant tanks. You started draining, but only gas was coming through. Liquid is there, but the gas entered first. You know what is this phenomenon called? Vortices. So, like a vortex, when a vortex is formed, air will enter first and liquid will not enter. So how to ensure that the entire liquid is drained properly and air is not entrapped? So this is another uh, very interesting study to understand vorticity and then liquid flow in a constrained area. So this is again a structural mechanics problem. So you can understand the variety of problems that is coming out of this area of structures. And the most interesting aspect of rocket which I mentioned earlier is its very low margin. So, some of the hardware is having margin as, as low as 0 0.06 and some of them will have high margin like 0 0.53, 0 0.06, 0 0.23, 0 0.11, 0 0.14, 0 0 0.04, the pairing has a very high margin for flight. So, the entire rocket is designed with such a thin margin. If you bend a little too much, it will break. But it has to stand and take the entire load. So, the challenge of a structural design in rocket is much more than maybe a civil engineer where you have a margin 2 to 3 or even 4 in your disposal. But I tell you, your challenge is to design structures with low margins now. You know, pre structures, hardware, prefabricated buildings, 
Uh, no, I am very optimized in DOM structures. They are all very optimally designed hardware where the margins are supposed to be very low. So, you also should have to have the modern techniques of simulation to understand structures and design them very optimally. And this is one of the challenges that every structural engineer should face. So, in summary, I want to tell you, in a rocket, there are low margins in design. So, when you say low margin, you need to understand material very well. When I tell steel, in, in uh, rocket design, steel is not the way you treat steel in civil engineering. In civil engineering, you may look at the yield strength and ultimate strength, that's it. But in, in steel, in uh, rocket design, we will look at the sustained term, its plasticity. We allow the material to merge to plastic conditions and still work in the steel. So, and we have to understand non-linear, non-linear and geometric problems have to be understood. Non-linear geometric problems also very, very well. And we have varieties of hardware. We have to make non-linear, hyperplastic material models. We have to understand temperature interactions and thermostructural problems of varied nature. And, and more importantly, the dynamics problems are very, very complex in a rocket structure. So, we, it requires a lot of varieties of study and expertise to handle a rocket structure design. So, with that, let me uh, thank you because I wanted to give only an overview of what is involved in designing the structure of a rocket and uh, other areas are equally complex like propulsion, cryogenics, uh, controls, electronics, uh, navigation and so many other areas. So this is one of the areas where the knowledge and expertise of engineers and scientists are required to understand, do the problems and make a very reliable rocket that is flying very well. So kudos to all my colleagues who have been working here and I was also fortunate to be part of their team to design and understand many of these complex problems and help them to make it wonderful design of GSLA Mark 3. So I thought of sharing with you only the bird's eye view of what we were doing in this area I did not go into any details because each of these problems requires one class by itself. For example, if I talk about flutter, itself is a problem that requires uh, minimum three hours of class. So I don't venture into that. I only want you to understand that this area itself is a very huge area having research potential, work potential and developments, etc. So in terms of codes, I want to tell you VSS is working on a final element code of themselves. You know about many of the final element codes? Anybody would have? Uh, beta in fact, many people don't study. Have you heard of ANSYS, NAS1, Abacus, NISA? Okay, so all these are standard softwares which are available in the market very costly. ISRO is making a software called FEAST, Final Element Analysis for Structures. It is available to educational institutions free. So I want you to you structural civil engineering people to download the FIS software. You can simply go to uh, vssc.gov.in inter internet site and there is a link called FIS link. There it is available free to download the executable file of the FIS, including manual is available. You can download and see this example problem. So how to solve structural problem using final different techniques. It is a non-limited non uh, software, you can run small problems and understand and once you are expert in that, we will be happy to come over here, load the full capability and train you to handle problems of this nature. So you can become a very good structural designer, you can apply civil problem, mechanical problem, any problem can be solved. <coughs> we are really capable to solve electromagnetic problems, heat transfer problems, all problems are possible and it's all designed by just five people in VSS. So, you are welcome to do that and I just showed some of the examples here. So, there is a great opportunity and career in structural engineering area as well. And I can tell you 50% of these jobs are done by civil engineers, not by mechanical engineers. So, kudos to all of them. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, actually, uh, filling this uh, liquid tanks, right? Like, uh, okay, yeah, that's the question. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, so I heard somewhere on a documentary that uh, SpaceX was recently building a stainless steel rocket. So that's actually a balloon tank. So if you don't fill the fuel first, no. Then the buckling is uh, cannot be prevented by liquids. Uh, buckling is prevented by pressurizing it. 
not by feeling very good. So it's like uh, some other guys. Uh, I tell you, I tell you how to learn buckling by pressurize. You take a balloon, you pressurize very very less. You can buckle it faster. You pressurize even more. It is you can only take more accelerators. So the more you pressurize. To the limited material strength, the bucket can be improved. No improved. That means compression capability of a tensile loaded structure can be improved by pressurizing. Tank is a pressurized structure which actually generates basically tensile stress fields, and when you apply compression, tension is reduced. You know, so it becomes stable there. Not by filling the liquid, by pressurizing it, it can be stabilized. So it's a compressed air or something. Compressed air or gas. In, in our case, we are using helium. Because the gas, helium is lighter than gas, so the air is very dense. So if you fill air, its mass is 50 kg. The air inside the tank, if I fill with air, it will be 50 kg. If I use helium, it will be 25 kg. <coughs> so I will fill with helium. So I don't know the Yeah. So essentially, all students, we don't actually know what happens in the industry. So uh, since I'm a mechanical engineering student, so for all practical cases, we usually use air standard assumptions. Like uh, for all engine cycles and stuff. So uh, I think so. Uh, for all these uh, engine cycles and stuff, um, for simulation and all, do you use air standard assumptions or will you always go for the uh, exact value of all you know coefficients? And yeah, stuff? air standard is not applicable in the rocket engine because when the rocket engine flies, there is no air. Rocket engines are designed to function when there is no no air. All the rocket engines function in the vacuum space, and we carry the fuel and oxidizer on board. And all of them, and the whole engine is a closed cycle, it's, a, it's not a closed cycle engine, it's an open cycle engine. The fuel and oxidizer comes, it burns, the energy is produced, and it is expelled into the atmosphere. So, conventionally, you cannot apply the classical thermodynamic cycles for this. So, but it can be adapted and applied. What we call cycles here is a different name, not the Brayton cycle or Carnot cycle or the diesel cycle, but we call it gas and water cycle. Stage combustion cycle, uh, like that. So, gas and water cycle is a cycle where we actually create a little bit of fuel and oxidizer, and we will come and run the turbine. The turbine will again pump the fuel, and the whole fuel and oxidizer burns in another chamber, chamber, and that produces thrust. So, the cycle analysis is similar to that, but not exactly like what you are learning. So, you cycle. And uh, for all cases, uh, we always uh, assume that combustion processes can be replaced with constant rolling heat or something like that, right? So, uh, uh, by analyzing these cycles, we follow such assumptions like uh, replacing a combustion process by a isobaric heat or a constant rolling heat uh, or do you just uh, simulate the entire chemical process? We are actually creating finer chemical molecular process in the simulator. We don't go with the gross level thermodynamic cycles at all. Because that is, that is not an efficient way of to understand the mechanics because we are interested in understanding temperature at every boundary. Because you are, I did not explain because the flame which is inside is not even having uniform temperature. The flame itself is non uniform in temperature. We are interested to know what is non uniformity there and where are the hot spots and how to cool them, what thickness is to be given, etc. has to be finally understood. So we actually go to the combustion model, we look at the species which is generated. So when the fuel and oxidizer burns, what are the carbon monoxide, how much percentage, etc. are produced, and what is the temperature of each of them, and how far the oxides, oxygen will be there, all this will be analyzed, analyzed in final detail. So one final question. Yeah. I don't know if it's relevant, but uh, I searched around the internet, but still couldn't find any uh, convincing answers. So it's the best opportunity, right? So, so uh, see, we have a lot of limitation with the CD now, so, right? Like altitude compensation and all. Conversion diagnosis. So, uh, so we have this uh, uh, aerospace diagnosis that NASA tested in one uh, single stage tour before. So, why don't we actually uh, continue research on that diagnosis uh, design, or why don't, why are we not building any more single stage tour orbit uh, type vehicles like launch vehicles? Even if we are use, uh, building reusable launch vehicles, they are never single stage tour, right? We are landing separate stages separately. So, uh, so that idea was parallel long time ago, right? So why are we not uh, continuing research on that particular topic? Like aerospace? I don't know, I don't know, many other people here would have understood the question. It's a good question. Uh, what he talks about is uh, why you are not building a single stage rocket to space. First, today, time for single stage rocket to space has not yet come. That's the answer. <coughs> because single stage rocket only a concept. And when you have actually designed it, you are 
structure should be extremely light. As it should be not more than one percent of the rocket mass. One point five is okay. If the rocket structure mass is one point five percent more than one point five percent of the entire rocket, one semi size rocket is not possible. Today, the typical structural factor of a rocket is eight to to fifteen percent. So even with the modern materials and the best materials that you are having, 15% is the mass of the structure. Rust is fuel. So this 15% has to come down to 2%. Then only semi-stage vehicle to orbit is possible. So time for two single-stage vehicle has not yet reached. May it happen? So the next alternative is only two-stage rocket, and two-stage rocket is theoretically possible. But even there, the structural factor cannot exceed more than 8%. There are also challenges out there, so that's why when SpaceX is building the two-stage rocket, they are going for all composite and non-light and all optimum hardware. They are talking about light stainless steel. They want to jettison the thermal protection system with evaporated cooling with stainless steel tanks, etc. They are discussing. So this is the first question here. Uh, last question. Answer to the last question. Now answer to your first question about aerospace nozzle versus CD nozzle and atmospheric condensation. CD nozzles are designed for certain regimes of flight. It is not optimum to design a, a nozzle which is operating in air to operate in vacuum. So, and since semi stage rocket is not there, it is not required. So, stages are multi stages. Hence, we can design an optimum nozzle for air and an optimum nozzle for vacuum. So, there is no need of a CD nozzle compensation. Aerospace nozzle is a very good nozzle, but it is technically more complex than the present nozzle because there is a spike inside. The temperature of the spike is very high, and the ability to make the engine it is more voluminous compared to the compactness of the present engine. Aerospace engines are massive and the size is heavy, though it has an advantage for CD compensation. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. This conference happens in uh, space because while logic, these comments are to be. Uh, the connections are to be so rigid. So we have a team called the Aerospace Mechanisms Group, and they design mechanisms for various functions. So separating one stage from the other, mechanisms are designed, and they make the hardware test it and do. Essentially, we use it using explosives, pyrotechnics. Uh, basically, we use RDX. You heard of RDX? That feel that I give up the same thing only. That the same RDX. We handle it in our place, and we process it into form uh, explosive tubes, and we put it inside. Uh, suppose there is an aluminium ring, you put that tube around and initiate it one side, simply cut it. That's it. So, what our RDS we are making, we are designing typically can cut a of steel sheet just like that in 10 millisecond, or even aluminium or anything that can cut. This is one technique of cutting. But I said it very simply. You put it and cut. But then we have to cut it such a way that it doesn't shatter it. See, if you put a that uh, Philip Exeter you would have seen, they put an RDX here, fire, and then tuck it explodes, and door is open. No, you have seen in movies, Suresh will be doing all that many times. So <laughs> it is not like that here. We have to control where we have to explode. When you put it a cut, there should be only cut and nothing else. The side should not shatter. You have to precisely cut. So cutting without any shattering is another technology. So it includes again structural design, designing of the joints properly, directional property of the charge. That when it fires, it will cut only in one direction. Do not cut this direction. So there are certain designs which are involved. So these are very trade secret. I will not reveal to you. But then there are other mechanisms which actually we can connect them. There are bolts which you connect, and each bolt is filled with a charge. And when you fire it electrically, the bolt will explode and it will separate. In PSLV, all the strap bolts are separated using exploding bolts. So the, the inside there is non-charge is fully electrically initiated. We have bands, steel bands which connects, and both sides it is cut using cutters, which again fired using RDX devices. So the technology of cutting using explosives is an art. And we have a team of 200 people working in this area who design and develop entire system internally and not done outside. It is trade secret of VSSC, and nobody else is allowed to do. We don't even give to anybody internally. We manufacture and supply for all our rockets and satellites. Okay. Okay. Thank you.